In August 1846, American troops marched into Santa Fe. Their goal was to annex this territory for the United States, which they did very successfully, supposedly without a single shot being fired. The Mexican governor of the province, Manuel Armijo, immediately surrendered, and they thought that they had won. But American troops immediately began independently motivated racial attacks. And a lot of these were also motivated by desire for land. If you were a landowner, it was very likely, if you were Mexican or Native American, that you would be lynched by American soldiers who were off on their own time. They weren't really ordered to do this as far as history is able to point out by their commanders, and the commanders did turn a blind eye to it. And what really stoked the fire even further was when the military appointed Governor Charles Bent, who was a friend of the American mountain man, the fur trappers, Kit Carson, and Jim Bridger and all of these kind of uh, intrigue figures living in and around Taos, New Mexico, which the locals viewed as just outsiders and people who came in to make a quick buck. And this has to be one of the most fascinating museums in Taos, and not a lot of people visit it. And what makes it such an interesting place is it's privately owned, and this is the Governor Bent House. In fact, it was through this wall. This hole is not original, but it's in the general area where it would have been that when the revolutionaries marched down the street, led by little Thomas, they had him in this area and they made it very clear what their intentions were and they left to go do something outside and they began trying to dig through the wall. Uh, he had already been scalped at that point, but he had not succumbed to his injuries and these implements on the wall here were actually, these are the original implements. We know this because they came from the family and they were donated to the museum. And uh, here you have the account of uh, someone who was present here. She was only five years old at the time. And you can buy copies of this account at the desk in the museum. And throughout the museum, you've got other artifacts which are not necessarily related to the killing of Bent. But a few of these artifacts are generally just uh, would have been used by the Native Americans at the same time or by the explorers. For example, this they believe is probably a rock that was used to sharpen arrow shafts. So they planned an uprising for Christmas of that year, but this didn't pan out because they were worried that their families were leaking information to the Americans or to people sympathetic to America. So this uprising was delayed until January 19th, 1847. And what happened here was it was led by two main figures, a Hispano man named Pablo Montoya and a local Native American man named Little Thomas. And it was at this date that coordinated attacks began happening around northern New Mexico. They killed sheriffs, they killed minor American political officials, but their biggest target was Governor Charles Bent, who was killed just a couple blocks over ahead of me. And behind me in Taos Plaza in 1847 in April, six leaders of this revolt were executed, and in total, 28 people would be hung in the plaza behind me during the Taos Revolt, which was a sort of populist extension of the wider Mexican-American War. In these back rooms here, they have kind of a sampling of what pioneer life would have been, but kind of space throughout here, you have things belonging to the Bent family. For example, this silk print here is actually a piece of Mrs. Bent's dress, and it lived in the family for many, many years until finally it was falling apart, and they tore the dress up, they cut it into different pieces, and because it was so beautiful, they gave it to different family members, and it made its way down to Nita Perkins, who donated this to the museum as well. And then just over here, you have genuine notices from the U.S. government as they invaded Santa Fe that Mr. Bent was going to be the new civilian governor. And this is supposedly an authorization by the President of the United States. And other people were appointed underneath him. The uh, district attorney, the treasurer, the marshal, the secretary of the territory, and uh, you have, of course, because it was a Hispanic community, the same written in Spanish underneath it. And this is, as far as I can tell, one of the only surviving copies. <laughs> 
of this declaration. And as we make our way over into the room used by Bent's family, this was Bent's original chair. He would have actually sat on this as he was passing laws here in Taos. Over here in this display case, you have Bent's family Bible. And it's amazing to me that all of this has been kept up as well as it has. Um, it has the birth dates of people inside of Charles Bent's family and uh, just different articles of clothing. The baby cap of the Bent family and different utensils they would have used to cook. Old newspaper clippings about the Taos Uprising. One of the saddest facts about the Taos Uprising was that very few combatants on either side were ever given proper burials. In fact, many of the Americans who were killed as a part of this revolt are buried behind me in unmarked graves. And the general layout of these chain of events is that Charles Bent was assassinated. And then the day after that, there was a spontaneous gathering of 500 people who supported the revolt who marched just north to a sort of trading post in a mill called Simeon Turley's Grand Mill. And this was a place operated by mountain men. Now, the revolutionaries had identified mountain men as one of the people who were responsible for the American occupation. They were people who took the Santa Fe Trail, they were the friends of Kit Carson, and they kind of really identified them strongly with the friends of Governor Charles Bent. So they were immediately their target. So these 500 revolutionaries surround the mill and begin firing on it. Now one of them manages to escape and get help from Santa Fe. And this is when 365 American troops are mobilized, which would later go on to defeat the 1,500 Spanish, Mexican, and Native American combatants. Now at the mill, only two people would survive. One of them was Tom Tobin, whose story I would love to tell very soon. But this group, Basically, 365 American soldiers, they marched onto Taos, and they forced them to retreat to Taos Pueblo and to the church there. And at this church, they fired on it, which was, you know, a war crime. They fired on the church, the Americans did, and they killed about 150 combatants and probably countless civilians, but history will never know the answer. Fifteen of them were immediately sentenced to death by hastily constructed juries composed of lawmakers who were friends of the people who had died in the uprising, so you can tell there was a conflict of interest, and the immediate result was six of them were hanged in Taos Plaza, and 28 would go on to be hanged entirely. In fact, the man who killed Governor Charles Bent was shot without trial. He was in his jail cell and somebody walked in and just shot him. Over at the memorial to the massacre at the mill in 1847, I was talking a little bit about how the local population had identified mountain men as the cause of all of their troubles, and that's why the mill was attacked. And here you can see Bent was one of the first men to use oxen to pull wagons on the Santa Fe Trail. And he was a famous mountain man. He was involved with the creation of Bent's Fort. He was sort of an agent there. And many other mountain men were appointed by Kit Carson, who was in the local community, such as Colonel Albert Pfeiffer, an Indian agent, and Tom Tobin, who would later go on to kill people who were involved with the revolt, particularly a man named Felipe Espinoza, whose story is absolutely fascinating. And this is inside of the Kit Carson Museum. It's a pretty popular tourist attraction, especially compared to the Charles Bent Museum. And apparently this room here was actually partly built by Kit Carson. He didn't really stay in this area in Taos for very long, but he was up at Bent's Fort where he worked for them as a hunter for a dollar a day for several years before coming back down here and kind of participating in the Taos Revolt. And uh, there's a fascinating 20-minute documentary in the film room just across the way in the courtyard.
because of his participation against the Mexicans in the Taos Revolt, a lot of people are still very angry at Kit Carson. And he was also involved with a lot of Native American massacres. And you can see that people burn the sign and write fuck on his grave. And there's a grave of someone who was killed at the Turley's Mill Massacre near him. And someone wrote Native Power 1680, which is in reference to something, actually kind of an interesting uprising. But his grave is just over here beyond the soldier's memorial. Right there. I just finished talking to one of the men who runs the Kit Carson House and Museum, and I asked him a little bit about all of the animosity, especially here in the Memorial State Park where he's buried. I see burn marks on the sign, I see the F word carved into his grave, and he said that he gets a lot of people who usually come in from outside or move into Taos from somewhere else, not people from Taos who they have come and spray painted the side of the building, they've tried carving Kit Carson's face off the side, and in reality, these are people who don't understand Kit Carson did commit massacres against the Native Americans. Nobody's claiming he didn't. They show this in a video just as you enter the, the building. It's a 20 minute long video. But towards his later years, he did advocate for the rights of the Navajo and the Apache to return to their homelands. And this was wildly unpopular at the time. Uh, he was an outspoken advocate for the rights of Native Americans. And this is something that, you know, people just want to it's a recent trend of standing up because a lot of American history, I will admit this, is rewritten. A lot of it is ignored or whitewashed, but Kit Carson, as a famous example of a lot of adventure tales told about him, but they didn't whitewash his history. He wasn't totally unkind to the Native Americans. I'm sitting now next to the grave of Reverend Jose Martinez, who's a very complicated figure in the history of the Taos Revolt. He was born in Abiquiu and joined Los Hermanos Penitentes, and as such was a very conservative and secretive man, and he really had a strong distrust for authority outside of the church. But sensing that an American occupation was imminent, he began teaching his students to learn the law, telling them that they needed to understand it because Americans would take up their land grants and give it out to homesteaders and, and pioneers. And once the revolt happened in 1847, a lot of people accused him of being behind it. One, because he was a member of Los Hermanos Penitentes, and two, because he had this strong love of his people, and he was working with Native Americans, the Genizaro, the Spanish, the Mexicans, and he really was deserving of the title, which is both on his grave and at his statue at Taos Plaza, the honor of his people. And his students would go on in the latter half of the 1800s to be actually involved with the American government of New Mexico. They were judges, they were sheriffs, they were congressional delegates, and he really helped transition because in 1848, a year after the revolt, he helped sign a document which turned over New Mexico to American authority. He didn't necessarily want violence and bloodshed, but a lot of people do believe that he was one of the motivating factors, if not directly ordering it, his religious preaching, kind of teaching, a way to express your own nationality, a way to stand up for your rights as Mexicans, as Spanish, as Genizaro, and this created a lot of animosity between him and the early American pioneers, but history has proven him 
to be a nobleman. I'm just coming along the high road to Taos now in order to go see Truchas and perhaps the Morada there. And I passed along Las Trampas, which according to the marker here, and I actually did not make a plan to visit this, was very well established by the early 1750s by a dozen families who came up from Santa Fe back when it was a Spanish province. I've been following this line of thought that Los Hermanos Penitentes, which was most active in these very remote communities, incorporated elements of crypto-Judaism. Essentially, in the 1600s, there was an inquisition going on, and a lot of the people that came over to settle the Spanish Empire, they were Jews from Portugal. So they had to kind of keep a secret behind closed doors spiritual practice. And one of the things that I see here is stones. And it is a very Jewish practice to leave stones as remembrance because if you take one letter out of the word stone in Hebrew, it spells permanence or memory. And so people will leave stones. You'll notice it very often on Jewish memorials and graves. And it kind of sets the stage for me to go into the possibility that perhaps the Penitentes, of course, a Catholic organization, a layman Catholic organization, but through the years, through the centuries, they are the final incarnation of a group of people which has chosen to keep, if not the Jewish religion, the Jewish customs and traditions alive in the most remote stretches of first the Spanish and then the Mexican states before it was incorporated into America. And the Penitentes are still around. They're still a religious group, but they do still like to keep to themselves because since the 1600s, they've been forced to do this. This is one of the few graves in the churchyard to have stones left on the top of it like this. But you will notice that they're buried on the western end of the courtyard, and they would be looking at the church as the sun sets behind them, and they're kind of similar in design. And the grave over here as well with a flower on it has another stone on top of it there. And notice that the flower has six leaves, or six petals. leave the church here, I noticed this all around the outside door, and this is something common as well to stone churches in England. You've got the Rose of Sharon, and it's a six-sided rose, so might be referenced to uh, Judaism as well in the Penitentes, but here you have two Roses of Sharon, and I was told that these are sort of lotuses which blossom in the Holy Land, so the Crusaders took to drawing them, and just above the door here you have several of them which will look a lot more like the European style because on the doorway left and right you have six just stick lines but here you have the rose with petals and it also goes over to a more esoteric sort of flower of life which is a Buddhist symbol and you can see these symbols all throughout religion and I have no idea what the one on the right is but you can see there's an arrow pointing downwards and it's not mirrored on the left side and it's kind of a folkloric belief amongst Europeans, at least back in the day, that circles would keep out evil spirits and the devil. So you have a lot of painted circles up here which are preserved in the archways, and they're fading now, but I wonder how many people know the significance of these paintings and of the Rose of Sharon. <laughs> 